Hello, my name is Lance Savet. I'm professor of pediatric neuromuscular disease at the University of Oxford, and I'm going to um, discuss with you um, the trial that is coming uh, in the coming weeks or months in, in the UK, which is called KICAS, the phase one two um, clinical trial of GTX 102001. So, first thing first, and a disclosure, um, we're going to talk about the trial not about the treatment, not about the cure, about the trial. And a trial is a trial, which means that the aim is not to treat a patient, it's not to cure patients, it's to answer a question. Does it work? And is it safe? And that's it. And in a phase one, two trial, actually the main question is, is it safe? So I think that it's important to consider when we start speaking about the trial to appreciate that if you take part in a trial it's not only for your child it's because you believe that things must move forward for the entire community so the drug that, um, which is investigated here belongs to a large family which are called the oligonucleotide antisense and these are new drugs, but not that new actually, because the first drugs were, were approved actually more than 22 years ago, right? And there are several drugs that have been approved over the last years. And myself, um, I have a quite large experience with some of these drugs, especially Spinraza, which as the uh, uh, GT, GTX 101 is a drug that is intrathecally delivered. Uh, so it's um, the same um, mechanism, uh, the same type of drug, the same family of drug, but also the same route of administration. So this is um, how it looks. Uh, how it looks. Uh, this is actually something that looks like uh, RNA but which is not an RNA, it is much more robust than an RNA and it allows to interfere with the splicing process of an RNA. And I, I won't um, discuss again the mechanism of action because Dora um, has explained it in, in a um, lecture. And so um, GTX, GTX 102 has been investigated in um, in monkeys, in non-human primates, in a single dose demonstrates a robust knockdown of UBF3A um, AS in, in key brain regions, um, which leads to paternal UBF3A RNA expression. Um, and, and the interest here is to see that actually um, the, the drug goes um, in the entire um, brain. So we're going to discuss about a phase one, two study, which means a study of which the primary objective is to demonstrate safety. Um, and the study has already um, started in the UK, in the US. Um, it was the first in human study with four monthly doses and a dose escalations um, with several um, groups um, and several different doses. Um, and as I told you, GTX 102 was delivered um, as um, uh, with a with a lumbar puncture, and there was no placebo actually. So the primary objective of, of this first study that, that that happened in the U.S. was safety, right? And then um, there were um, secondary objectives uh, like pharmacokinetics, um, which means um, how much um, after injection do we find drug in uh, the CSF and in the blood and there was an exploratory objective which was efficacy. So first safety and then efficacy. So the key inclusion criteria of uh, this first study in the US was deletions um, and age between 4 and 17 years at screening, stable seizure control, normal kidney and liver test and able to tolerate anesthesia. Actually, um, it doesn't mean that the drug cannot work for um, 
uniparental uh, dysomy or for point mutations. It doesn't mean that the drug cannot work for children younger than four years or for young adults. It's just that when you conduct a trial, you first need to go on a very well-defined populations and try to get population that is homogeneous. And when it comes to a trial, you have inclusion criteria and you have exclusion criteria, and you cannot play around. I mean, if it's four to 17 years, it's four to 17 years. If the child is one day older than the inclusion criteria, you just cannot include these patients. Um, so there were several um, exploratory endpoints for um, the efficacy, even if efficacy was, was not the primary endpoint, and you know it better than me as parents, that when it comes to Angelman, we need to investigate all different aspects of the disease, like sleep, seizures, communication, behavioral cognition, motor function, and all of this was actually investigated using um, a battery of outcomes. So this is what happened in the US. Actually, there was a three cohort. Um, in each cohort, uh, the, um, uh, the dose, the starting dose was different. And as you can see, um, in the first cohort, it was 3.3, but then they rapidly escalate, escalated to 20 milligrams. And in the second and the third cohort, the, the, the dose was much higher. And then happened adverse events. In all patients, there was a transient ataxia and fatigue, which was dose related. It was primarily observed in the um, in patients who received uh, 20 milligrams and more. Um, it was of a variable severity from one to another patient, and it started very quickly after the injection and lasted for one or three days. Right? And then patients um, uh, could um, go back to the um, normal uh, previous way of functioning. Um, and anesthesia was quite well uh, tolerated. This is what we call an adverse event. And it's not serious because it doesn't lead to hospitalization. It doesn't need to it doesn't lead to death. It, it's an adverse event. But there was there were also serious adverse event. And in all five patients was observed a mild to moderate lower extremity weakness. Um, and it occurred later, six to 30 days after the last infusion, um, with significant weakness in, in three of the patients and inability to work in two patients. Of course, when it happened in a trial, you need to stop, right? You need to be sure that, that, that to understand what happens, and the good thing is that um, this was uh, uh, this was uh, reversible, and, and patients uh, retrieved their normal uh, functioning. But nevertheless, two of the patients during um, uh, several days were unable to work, and this was really related to the highest dose. So actually, it was related more than probably to inflammation um, of the uh, of the nerve. Um, around the, the injections, which you do not observe with other antisense nucleotide and was really related to, to the dose. And at the same time, uh, we could observe improvement um, in, in all patients, um, and this is the, the clinical global impression um, after uh, four um, months of treatment. And as you can see, um, there were quite a significant improvement for fine motor communication behavior. And that is the gross motor function that was actually declining um, in these patients. It means that maybe, maybe we have um, some efficacy. And I say maybe because we're talking about five patients without placebo, but it's sure also that, that, that at the highest dose, there is a real risk of safety issues. So the UK protocol that is starting with the approval of um, MHRA, and we still um, need to, to get some uh, the final approval um, of the ethics, um, will start with much lower dose, 3.3 and 5 milligrams. Um, 
and there are four monthly, monthly doses over three months and then maintenance over once every three months. And actually the dose will, um, the final dose will be also dependent upon the absence of safety issues and also signal of efficacy. As you can see, this is quite a, a, a significant protocol in terms of burden, right? They are the injections, but they are also several tests um, at very precise day. And this is something important to consider when you take part of a trial. I mean, if the next injection is, for instance, at um, day 44, day 30, I mean, this is day 30, right? And, and it's not possible to say, well, you know, maybe next week or the week after, I cannot do it this week. No, if um, we are in a protocol, we, we must carefully follow the schedule of event. So that's um, all the tests that are, um, that are planned in this protocol. And as you can see in the maintenance dose, patients will receive the drug every 84 days. So a little bit less than every three months. Um, how is it going to happen in terms of anesthesia? We cannot do it without anesthesia. This is just impossible. Um, and we need um, to um, have either an anesthesia, either a sedation. Um, we will try to do our best to make sedation only and there is a paper that has been published in the US by a team that is also performing this trial that shows that actually um, in another disease which is Neem and Pig in which we face the same issue we could afford um, with um, inhalation induction and mask maintenance in patients and only a limited needed to get an anesthesia. So these are the um, place where, where you can find the information. If um, you wish to connect with me as the coordinating investigator in the UK, I will be more than happy um, to give you additional information. And these are the clinical sites in which you can find more information. Then we have received several questions before the symposium. Um, is there a specific age group? Um, when will all the patients be included. First, we need to know um, what are the data in this first trial before considering other patients, but obviously there is no reason that um, uh, they, they could not be at one point some extension. But the very first step is to gather data in this well-defined population. Which genotype? When will other genotypes be included later? Um, and we must consider that the better we know the natural history of Angel Man, the better are the, the data that we have in our hands for natural history, the easier it will be to bridge um, the data that are acquired in a specific age group for specific mutations and the larger group of patients in terms of age and in terms of mutations. Is there other trials coming? Yes, there are many others and we need to be ready. We need to improve our clinical trial readiness in the UK. Can I put um, two of my children for, uh, forward? Um, sure, you can. Um, just connect with us. Will there be a cost? No. Um, a trial um, cannot cost you anything and there is um, also reimbursement of any fees um, and of your time. Um, when will this trial be available in the UK? We are um, working hard to make it happen in the autumn. How many children will be involved in the UK trials? Well, it's up to 12, maybe, um, because it's a trial that will take place in the UK and in the Canada, and probably Canada will start a little bit before the UK. If successful, what is the time frame for the drug to be available? This is just impossible to say, and probably it is um, at the bare minimum between about four years before it becomes NICE approved. But this is, you know, a pure speculation. Um, will participants be able to receive the drug after the clinical trials? That's the norm. It means that if a drug is efficient and is working, 
and that we feel that the, the, the clinical development must continue or that approval can be um, obtained, the rule is generally that patients keep on medications. Of course, if it doesn't work, I mean, it is better for everybody to stop. Can this type of treatments help adults? Um, probably, but one more time, we will need to bridge the data we get in children into adults. And this is an additional reason for which we need the natural history study. But will convince NICE to recommend NHS to offer this drug? The quality of the data, the quality of the study, and the understanding of the epidemiology in the UK, I can tell you that is primarily important. What will happen with potential improvement as the drug wears off um, like five new words have been learned, um, will they be forgotten? We don't know. We just don't know and we need to, to see. How many times per year will be will a top up be needed? Actually, it's every 81 uh, days, so nearly 84 days, sorry, so uh, nearly three months. What if there is a more potent or efficient drug available? Actually, the investigator must inform you about other options. Um, sometimes it's not possible to go in a trial if you are already on another medication. It's very dependent from one to another um, treatment. There is already a global Angelman uh, registry. Does it cover the same question as the upcoming NHS would? Certainly not. Both are important, but they don't cover the same kind of information. A natural history is something prospective with well-defined outcome by the same team. And the global Angelman uh, registry is very important to have a kind of broad view. So we need both. And um, we need the natural history um, certainly to pave the way to more clinical trials um, to get faster um, the nice approval and, approval and also to, to be able um, to bridge the data that we have in a limited populations to other phenotypes, to other genotypes and to other patients. Um, you have my address in, in, this, uh, in the slides. You have the address of, of Dr. Marchetti. Please feel free to connect with us. And the very last thing I want to say is that um, I truly hope one day we'll have one of several drugs for Angelman. And today, um, we have um, several drugs for SMA. And the time for newborn screening has come for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, unfortunately, it's a slow and painful process in UK. We have initiated a parliamentary petition. Please sign it. And I really look forward in 10, 15 years maybe to do the same for Angelman. But let's show our government that we care about rare disease. So please, if you're convinced, go on the site, sign it and forward the petition um, to your contacts, to your friends, promote it on social network. Thank you for your attention. Please feel free to, to touch um, if you have any questions. Thank you.